Good morning. Thank you for attending the latest uh, Breakfast on the Moon. This one celebrating Apollo 16, the second to last Apollo landing on the lunar surface at this time 50 years ago today. Uh, we're going to start off our presentation with Lisa Westwood and Beth O'Leary, who are going to do a presentation for us on this really, really fascinating subject of in space archaeological site. So I would no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Lisa and off you guys go. Well, thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate the good introduction and I hope that you can all see my screen. It is such a wonderful opportunity to be here today to present to you this morning. And I want to give a big shout out to the Sacramento L5 Society for hosting this event. We're excited to be here. My name is Lisa Westwood. I am a registered professional archaeologist with over 26 years of experience in cultural resources management. And I am the Vice President and Director of Cultural Resources for eCorp Consulting. We are headquartered here in the Sacramento area. And I'm also on faculty at California State University, Chico and Butte College, where I teach archaeology and anthropology courses. I am joined by my co-author and really good friend, Dr. Beth O'Leary. Beth is also an archaeologist and a pioneer in the field of space archaeology. She is an expert and author of several academic books. She has been working with the state of New Mexico, NASA, and internationally with the International Council on Monuments and Sites, all about preserving historic archaeological sites on the moon. And we're really excited to be part of this event today and to be part of such an esteemed panel of speakers and guests. It's really an honor. And as you would probably expect, this topic is pretty broad. So today we're going to be really introducing you to the field of space archaeology. We're going to talk about our efforts to document and preserve the archaeological site of Apollo 11's Tranquility Base. And we're going to talk about the need to ensure that these important Apollo sites, all of them, are preserved for future generations before it's too late. Now, when people hear that Beth and I are space archaeologists and we, we talk about space archaeology, it's almost always met with giggles and images of Indiana Jones in a spacesuit, or they think we're walking encyclopedias of space travel and space knowledge, and, and none of that's actually true. Um, what we really do is we research, we educate, we advocate, and we seek to preserve the material culture of space history by applying the methods and theory of archaeology and historic preservation to some of the most important sites in human history. Some of the photos that you're looking at here are those of us at professional archaeology symposia and meetings doing just that. And this may be the first time that many of you have actually even heard about archaeology in the context of space history. And so I'm going to turn it over to Beth and ask her to give a little bit of a primer on what archaeology is. Beth? Well, thanks for that introduction, Lisa. Well, first of all, let's get a definition of archaeology. It's the study of the relationship between patterns of material culture and patterns, I think, our lives submit to archaeology. Uh, I can look at my desk right now and look at the artifacts that are there. And there's sticky notes, uh, my glasses, uh, some jump drives. And essentially, they and the patterning that they have created, uh, I'm looking at how it relates to human behavior. So there are no real time limits and there are no spatial limits. Archaeology has been done on all continents, underwater, in orbit, and in outer space and celestial bodies. So space archaeology studies the material culture in outer space that is clearly the result of human behavior. And there's a lot of material culture which is exoatmospheric. It's part of a larger assemblage, which until a certain point in time was confined to Earth and then entered the archaeological record somewhere else. I want to stress that Space archaeology involves a huge cultural landscape that is a vast interconnecting network of material both on Earth and in space. And it varies from the launch complexes at Kennedy Space Center to Tranquility Base, which we're going to talk about tonight. Um, Lisa and I started in this field and it has grown amazingly. 
There is a new study which is ongoing at the International Space Station and uh, an archaeological project that looks at square meter areas, kind of like floating test pits. And on the ISS, they're looking at the behavior of the astronauts with the material culture there. So Kayla uh, Barron, the astronaut here in the lower corner, um, uses tools and performs uh, activities. Now, archaeologists Alice Gorman and Justin St. Walsh seek to understand patterns of human use and how they change on people in outer space. Uh, in April, I presented a paper on planetary geoarchaeology, working with geoarchaeologists who are used to be used to using the methods typically on Earth, and they are studying the alteration, the preservation, and destruction of space heritage on extraterrestrial surfaces. So remember, there are both natural and cultural processes that affect the archaeological record. Uh, next slide. I don't know about you guys, but I rank the exploration of space right up there with the discovery of fire uh, about one million years ago and use by our an ancestors. Um, the material culture of space is very diverse. It's fragmented, it's non-renewable, and it's not quite that old, about 65 years, and it is still being created. A good deal of it is very remote, for example, Voyager 1 was a spacecraft launched in 1977, and it is now almost 24 billion kilometers from Earth. Now, Voyager 1 is currently the human artifact farthest from Earth. We are uncertain how the natural processes in space, such as micrometeorites, solar wind, temperature change, affect our artifacts and structures and objects up there. And both these natural and cultural processes can change or destroy the places that are significant to the history of space exploration. And on Earth, there are cultural effects like vandalism and looting, and also our own human neglect. Many significant sites connected to space exploration are eroding, they're abandoned in place, and some have completely disappeared. Examples include in California, Santa Susana, the Honeysuckle Creek in Australia. So many sites on Earth and on the moon are at risk by future uncontrolled access to these significant places. Uh, next slide. Well, I started in this field now, it's, it's going to sound old, uh, over two decades ago. And in 1999, I got a question from Ralph Gibson, a graduate student, when I was teaching a course in federal and state preservation law. And he asked, what about the archaeological sites on the moon? Do preservation laws apply there? It's a great question. So with a small grant from the New Mexico Space Grant Consortium, we decided to focus on Tranquility Base, the first lunar landing site, as worthy of our investigation. It was the first time that anyone had looked at Tranquility Base as an archaeological site. And I think it's the first time that NASA had funded archaeologists. So what happened there? Well, on July 20th, 1969, two humans landed on the lunar surface. It was an extraordinary event. Over 600 million people watched or listened as Neil Armstrong set down his left foot on the lunar surface. Armstrong and Aldrin were the first human footprints on another celestial body, while Michael Collins circled the bomb. They stayed on the moon for only 21.6 hours, but the astronauts carried their material culture to a new place in the universe. Next slide. Well, we all know the famous quote by Armstrong when he stepped onto the surface of the moon, but he also said, and I quote, yeah, we left a few things up there. It took an amazing amount of research and development to get those two guys on the moon. There were an estimated 60,000 engineers, physicists, architects, machinists, medical personnel, radio operators to do what John F. Kennedy had asked for 
to get a man on the moon and return him safely to earth. I think a huge part of the job must have been to get all the people to work together. Lisa is going to talk about the technology and, and how challenging it really was. Thanks, Beth. You know, frankly, I think it's a little hard to believe that we even made it there in the first place. You know, <laughs> given the level of technology available in the 1950s and 60s, at least compared to today. It, you know, it's been said that there's more technology present in a singing greeting card than there was in the entire command module that's shown here. Maybe that's true, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but the point is important and it's relevant in a couple of ways. The equipment that was brought up there had to be carefully designed and manufactured to operate in unknown conditions with an unknown success rate at an unknown weight. And weight was particularly important because everything about the mission, well, maybe not everything, but a good chunk of the mission depended on, you know, including the descent to the lunar surface and ascent back up to the orbiting command module. It was all based on computations made using a slide rule or portable calculators like the ones that you see here. And they factored in weight too heavy and they wouldn't have enough fuel to get back up to the command module or um, to get home. And that's a scary risk for the astronauts. I'll come back to the weight issue here in a minute, but complicating matters was that all of the plans for going to the moon were being developed within the context of the Cold War space race. So the, the pressure was really on. In 1961, on a really tight schedule to meet President Kennedy's directive, Bill Fleming's committee at NASA was tasked with carrying out a study called, quote, a feasible approach for an early manned lunar landing. In only four weeks, um, he had to say this about what should happen when a person first stood on the moon, quote, very little study has gone into precisely what operations would take place on the moon or how they would be executed, unquote. So in retrospect, it's kind of a miracle that the lunar landing happened at all. But needless to say, it was not as simple as simply grabbing the tongs off of your barbecue or raiding your toolbox and for a hammer and packing your bags for the moon. I mean, in fact, some of the tools and equipment used during the missions were designed specifically for the mission and we, they were left behind on the lunar surface to make room for about 20 pounds of samples of rock and sediment that were brought back to Earth. So for some of those tools and equipment, only prototypes exist on Earth. They were one of a kind artifacts and once they served their purpose, it was not necessary to lug them back to Earth again. Again, they were too heavy. So when, when the astronauts left the moon and, and to return home, they had to jettison most of these artifacts and an archaeological site was born. I'm going to hand it back to Beth to describe the archaeological site at Tranquility Base in a little bit more detail. Thank you, Lisa. Well, so what do we know about Tranquility Base as an archaeological site? What would be the ultimate forensic proof? As an archaeologist, we always ask, what's in situ? What's in place? Well, the iconic footprints and the human trails on the moon would be considered features or non-portable objects that are still on the moon. And we also have the scientific experiments left there. Well, here's a map of Tranquility Base um, overlaying a baseball diamond. Uh, I'm not sure if you're a Red Sox fan, but also um, this area is encompassed in a, a similar size to a soccer field or about 6,700 square meters or two acres. You can see the lem in the center and that's the descent stage. And to the upper left is the flag and the solar wind composition staff. And you can also see the trails that Armstrong made going to and from the Little West Crater. Now, this is an event that was happening now almost 53 years ago, and it's documented by copious photos, tapes, drawings, uh, the prototypes, and a lot of which is in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. I think Lisa and I would both argue that this is humanity's most important archaeological site. Next. Well, archaeologists know that one of the most important parts of documenting and preserving the information at an archaeological site is to create a site map. So we looked in many archives to look for a map from the original event. This is our archaeological site map based on the USGS surface traverses map. 
Note the concentration zone of artifacts. And these are located around the limb. And note also what we call a lunar toss zone. Well, why is this? Well, for approximately eight minutes, the Apollo 11 astronauts jettisoned a lot of artifacts before they left the surface of the moon. During their stay, they had created, they had um, collected over 20 kilograms of lunar rocks and regolith to take back. They had only one chance to lift off and reconnect for the voyage home, and they wanted to make sure that they made it. So Aldrin and Armstrong stood on the limb and threw out the artifacts in one sixth the Earth's gravity. And this map represents the predictions where some of that stuff would land within a toss zone. It's based on the work of another archeologist, Lewis Binford, who recorded toss zones for Inuit hunters sitting around a campfire in Alaska. As you can see, it's a simple scaled sketch map. So what's up there? Next. Well, during this research, we did discover to our surprise that NASA had neither a complete inventory nor description of what we call an assemblage of artifacts and features at Tranquility Base. And I have to say, we still don't know exactly what's up there. Of course, it would have been nice for NASA to have funded us to go back to the moon and do an actual archeological survey, but we really didn't get that much funding. So I'm gonna highlight some of the assemblage. Well, the lunar module descent stage is still there. The ascent stage took off when the two astronauts left the lunar surface and it was jettisoned after they reunited with Collins. There are not just scientific experiments on the moon. It's important to remember that we as human beings carry our culture with us no matter where we go. We are a species that creates and uses symbols. On the moon, there are commemorative artifacts like the US flag. One of the first activities the Apollo 11 astronauts did was to place the American flag on the moon. Even though they could not own the moon by international treaty. The act was symbolic of claiming territory and victory in the Cold War and the space race. It's set by historic precedent. A silicon disk was left there carrying messages from 73 nations, not including the former USSR. Next. Well, the astronauts had a lot of things to do on the moon. They placed the lunar laser ranging retro reflector there. It's about the size of a large bread box with an array of mirrors. It produced many important measurements. For the first time, it could measure the exact distance from the earth to the moon of 378,000 kilometers. It found that the moon is receding from the earth at about 3.8 centimeters a year, and it plotted variations in the rotation of the moon, which relate to the distribution of the mass inside the moon. And that implied a very small lunar core with a radius of about 350 kilometers. Well, the most amazing fact is that it is still returning data from the moon, as are other laser reflectors from Apollo 14, 15, and two USSR lunar missions that place reflectors. Recently, the, Apollo, the Luna 17, the USSRs, was rediscovered in 2010. At Tranquility Base, there are discarded space boots. They weren't necessary to come home. And other waste as part of the archeological assemblage. This is the first debris from human beings on another celestial body. Next one. Well, there are a lot of prosaic artifacts as you scan through this list, like hammers and brackets and tubes, and a skong, which is a one-of-a-kind combination scoop and tong. These objects are evidence of the scientific technology at the time. Using the space technology from 1969 
9 allowed the astronauts to bring back both moon rocks and regolith and date those to 3.7 billion years ago. The solar wind composition experiment staff is still there. There was a thin aluminum sheet attached to the staff, which allowed solar wind particles to embed themselves. The flux of electrically charged particles from the sun were collected and they were returned with the astronauts to Earth. There is a passive seismic experiment. <clears throat> Pay attention to number 12 there. That's a mission patch. And that symbolically honors the fellow astronauts, White, Grisham, and Chafee, who perished earlier in a tragic accident. It is a memorial on the moon. Our symbols in the form of material culture are on the moon. Next. Well, as you look at through the inventory, you can see there's a lot of stuff. Check out number 79 the plastic cover for the flag which was left, as well as the flag which was strung up on a pole with a perpendicular arm. Now we think the flag was probably knocked over when the astronauts lifted off from the lunar surface and maybe after 53 years, really only a bleach skeleton of itself, but it is still there. Next slide. So, Two astronauts climbed down from the limb and they walked around. There is not just one iconic footprint as in the center photo here, there is a trail of space boots made by two humans. These footprints rival the preserved footprints at Laetoli, Tanzania, made by our ancestors, the Australopithecines 3.6 million years ago. There were a lot of photos taken on the moon, but there's one amazing one that was taken by Neil Armstrong. You can see it here um, to my right. And where we can see Armstrong's reflection in Aldrin's helmet. So this is a one of a kind selfie on another celestial body. I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to talk about the importance of context. Thank you, Beth. So. To, to kind of to wrap that up, you know, people ask, how do you know what was up on the up at Tranquility Base? Well, generally speaking, NASA knows what it took up to the lunar surface and it knows what it brought back. So you do a little bit of simple math and you can figure out what what they didn't bring back is probably still up there. And then when you talk with the astronauts themselves and they explain what they've done, then it makes a lot of sense. So that's how we came up with that inventory. And so people then ask the next question. How do we know? Is it still there? Well, we suspect, as Beth said, that the flag is bleached and probably toppled over by the force of the ascent module returning back to orbit. And the actual original first footprint it has, was long since trampled upon by the astronauts themselves. But recent photos from the LRO mission can actually pick up some of the equipment that's left behind. And you can see that on this image. Even the astronaut tracks that uh, are beyond the blast zone are still visible. Scientists also believe that due to the lack of atmosphere and a kind of a relatively stable environment that the only indication of the passage of time is probably a, a thin coating of moon dust. But like, unlike many historic sites here on Earth, no one has been back since 1969 to damage, destroy, or remove those artifacts. And for these reasons, it's highly likely that's, that a lot of the site retains sufficient integrity. And why this matters is that the site's ability to be considered eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places hinges on integrity. The concept of, of integrity is an important one under US federal law, which does not extend to the moon in my opinion, but it's relevant to historical significance. In order for a historical site to be considered significant and eligible for inclusion in the National Register, the site has to meet certain criteria and retain sufficient integrity in order to convey that significance. But integrity isn't just in the form of physical integrity. And a site doesn't have to be in perfect condition in order to retain integrity for this purpose. In fact, there are seven aspects of integrity. It's location, materials, design, setting, workmanship, feeling, and association. So for example, you have an archaeological site that is in its original place on the landscape, 
and it includes artifacts and features that were left in place by the original occupants and when they were doing something really important in history, and we know who those original occupants were, it's said to retain integrity of location, materials, and association, possibly more. But if you take those artifacts away and you return them to Earth, they are no longer in primary context. Artifacts are like little tiny packets of information. And part of that information is dependent upon their location in situ, which means in place. So the site in that scenario would have lost its integrity by removing artifacts and bringing them back to the earth. Now, the, the National Register criteria that I just mentioned a moment ago were established in federal law, and there are four of them. Criterion A is the site associated with important events in history. Criterion B is the site associated with important persons in history. It's criterion C, does the site embody distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction? Does it represent the work of a master? And criterion D, does the site have the potential to yield important information in history that's not documented elsewhere? And it usually goes without saying that, you know, the archaeological site at Tranquility Base, representing the first time humans stepped foot on another celestial body, is important. I mean, we as a species, that finally figured out how to understand and then overcome the physics of our environment so that we could actually propel humans beyond the gravitational force of Earth to another celestial body into an environment that's not friendly to life as we know it and bring them back sa safely home again. All of this without an iPhone. And we did this through this collective human genius and the development of material culture that began a million years ago with the first control of fire. Fire would ultimately be the driving force that allowed the, the whole genesis to take off to technology to work in the first place. Now, the Apollo ast astronauts are some of the most important humans in history, no question. They used unique and mission-specific tools and equipment, now artifacts on the lunar surface, and that these represent the technology of the Cold War era space race. And these artifacts and their spatial relationship and distribution across the lunar landscape provides important information about human activity during one of the most important historical events in human history. So in other words, Tranquility Base meets all four of these criteria and it retains sufficient integrity. Now, therefore, the archeological site is eligible for inclusion in the National Register. Whether or not it can actually be placed on the National Register is another more complicated legal issue that Michelle Hamlin can speak to. And we knew this going into this. We knew this was going to be a challenge because of the legal restrictions that, that exist. So we started at the state level. In 2010, Beth and I, supported by a number of our colleagues and our college students, were successful in our efforts to list the archaeological site of Tranquility Base on the state historical registers for California and New Mexico. We received a lot of support for this from professional archaeologists, historians, historic preservation professionals all over the world. It's kind of a no-brainer that Tranquility Base is so important and it needs to be recognized as such. We had support from members of Congress and legislators at all the state levels. And what we found in these conversations was really interesting. We found that some states have laws that require that a resource be located within the, the, like the political boundaries of that legal territory of that state in order to be listed. But others, like California, New Mexico, don't. They just require that it be associated with the state. In, in addition, in 2014, we met with state congress, congressional representatives from the state of Hawaii. And they, the state of Hawaii is one of those states that required that, at least at the time, required that a resource be located within the physical boundaries of the state to be listed on that state register. And so because they were not able to list it for that reason, we actually helped them draft a resolution to designate July 20th, 2014 as Tranquility Base Day in the state of Hawaii. And Buzz Aldrin wrote a strong two-page endorsement of the designation. We were pretty excited about that. Members of Congress also expressed interest. In 2010, we met with then Congressman Dan Lundgren of California, who knew personally the Apollo 1 astronauts. They had trained together. 
And they had perished in the fire, of course, and um, he felt compelled to honor their memory. And he supported the designation of Tranquility Base as a National Historic Landmark. We drafted the Tranquility Base National Historic Landmark Act in 2010, but Congressman Lundgren lost his reelection bid and the effort died. But the efforts to recognize Tranquility Base and Space Heritage are still going strong. In 2010, uh, 2020, King County, Washington listed the Apollo program's lunar roving vehicles on the moon as historic landmarks, and Michelle Wilmot is going to be discussing that here shortly. And then in addition, a nonprofit called For All Moonkind was established by our panel host, Michelle Hanlon, also joining us today, and they have made outstanding strides in the international community. But let's start with California. Um, California is one of, the, one of several space states that was instrumental in the, in the Apollo program. There are many direct and indirect ties between California and Tranquility Base and the, the Apollo program overall. Uh, for example, uh, North American Aviation in Southern California built the command and service modules. Edwards Air Force Base helped train astronauts. Santa Susana Field Laboratory and Aerojet in Sacramento are two of the rocket testing facilities that help take astronauts to the moon. And Beth and I, along with Wayne Donaldson, published a book called The Final Mission, Preserving NASA's Apollo Sites, and we highlighted so many facilities in California and elsewhere that are lesser known to the public that have strong ties to the Apollo program and, and to Tranquility Base. And it was because of that association and the way that the laws are written in California that the site on the moon was eligible for listing in the California Register of Historical Resources. So the following January, I stood before the California Historical Resources Commission, pretty nervous, I'm not gonna lie. Um, the news media had already picked up the story and the state's attorneys were already alerted and Ralph Gibson and I gave it our best shot. We spoke to the important associations between Tranquility Base and California. We addressed the legal implications head on. And after a really lengthy debate and uh, discussion during a public hearing, the commission voted unanimously to list Tranquility Base on the California Register. And in doing so, this became the first cultural resource not located on Earth to ever be listed on a historical registry anywhere. It was a pretty exciting day. And I would be totally remiss if I did not acknowledge the commission for their action that day. I mean, they stepped up and in doing so, they, they took a stance in favor of an incredibly important resource and made history themselves. So then we approached the state of New Mexico and Beth is going to walk us through that. Beth? Well, thank you, Lisa. And I have to applaud California for being the first state to put these objects and structures at Tranquility Base on its stage cultural uh, registry January of 2010. And we followed in April of the same year in New Mexico. So Lisa, can you pick up just for a second yeah. while Beth reconnects? Absolutely. So we, after we got through California, we went, to, um, we went to New Mexico and we worked with a lot of our students. And I actually have a master's degree from New Mex in New Mexico as well. And when we looked at New, the New Mexico Cultural Properties Act, it, it did recognize, similar to California, it recognizes sites that are relevant to the people and to the culture of New Mexico. And for Tranquility Base in particular, we found a lot of examples within southern New Mexico in, per, in particular, um, White Sands Missile Range, uh, where Werner von Braun worked on V-2 rockets um, taken from Germany after the war. There's a lot of that down in southern, southern New Mexico. Its descendants launched the first satellites and then later propelled humans into space. Um, Holloman Air Force Base is another one, the high-speed test track tested the G-force on the human body uh, on a man named Colonel John Staff, who survived incredible forces, actually 632 miles per hour in five seconds, I believe. Um, then we also have Ham, who was the first uh, chimpanzee to go into space. He was trained at Holloman Air Force Base. And his remains are actually buried at the New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo. There's also, of course, shown in the lower section of the, of the screen, Apache Point Observatory, which continues to use that laser ranging retro reflector that Beth had spoken about earlier. Beth, are you back? 
Uh, I'm back. I may go again, but I'm going to keep going. And thank you for taking over. Um, all righty. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure where we're where we're going, but slide 23. All right. There we go. Okay. Well, there. The most important idea about space heritage is that it has involved a lot of people, and there are geniuses all over the country and all over the world. And in the US, as Lisa and I met with historic preservationists in other states, we realized that in every state in the union and in Puerto Rico, there are archeological sites which are involved in the research and the development of space exploration. Of course, many of these early sites um, uh, and continuing into the present are on restricted or military installations. Both Holloman in New Mexico and the Edwards Air Force Base are part of the military. Now, many others, others were critical places in getting humans into space and onto the lunar surface. And both Florida and Texas, of course, have several sites that are on the National Register or are National Historic Landmarks, including areas of Cape Canaveral uh, and Mission Control in Houston. And in June 2019, NASA officially reopened the Apollo Mission Control Center in Houston after a $5 million restoration effort with the help of a community of backers that brought back every last detail. Apollo Mission Control has artifacts such as antiquated consoles that monitor Gemini, all the Apollo missions and 21 space shuttle missions. And this project really shows what can be achieved in historic preservation at the local level. And it serves to encourage students to preserve, to pursue careers in science, technology, and engineering, which is one of our goals in space heritage. Next one. Well, there are other sites, and they evidence the earliest rocketry, such as the Robert Goddard rocket launching site in Auburn, Massachusetts, where my Swedish grandparents immigrated. Space heritage sites stretch across the country, in Alaska and Hawaii. In Alaska, there were sites that tested the effects of cold weather on personnel and equipment, and also there is the telescope at Mauna Kea, Hawaii, which was built to serve NASA's needs, although it has a contested history with indigenous peoples there. Of course, there are many universities and scientific facilities in Virginia and Maryland. And we should mention the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, whose huge radio telescope recently experienced a terrible catastrophe. Although some of the scientific facilities continue to function in Arecibo, the site is one of the most memorable symbols in astronomy. And it is also culturally important to the people of Puerto Rico. It is part of the heritage of space. Next. Well, if you know Cold War history, the former USSR was our main opponent in, in the space race beginning in the 1950s. They had most of the firsts in space. They launched the first satellite, the first dogs into space with the best known Laika in 1957, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin in 1961, and the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova in 1963. They launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, which essentially opened the historic space age. And it has been visited now by many Russians and international tourists. It is still being used to launch both cosmonauts and astronauts into space today. Russia has most of the earliest robotic sites on the moon with its Luna missions. As Lisa and I acknowledge, humanity has been involved in the space age from its earliest beginnings on Earth. Many facilities all over the world contribute to the historic content of space and exploration beginning in the Cold War and continuing today. Just to mention a few, 
the Deep Space Network in Madrid, Spain, and two sites in Australia. The Parks Observatory in New South Wales um, has a telescope which tracked the Apollo 11 through its journey, gathering voice signals, telemetry, and television signals. It's still functioning. Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station near Canberra, Australia, was a NASA Earth station instrumental in getting those first televised moments of the landing on the moon by the Apollo 11 astronauts. It is now nothing more than a concrete pad. Next. Well, the moon has a lot of cultural material. It has a huge assemblage on its surface. We have estimated over 400 metric tons of cultural material on the lunar surface today. The former USSR holds the record for the first mission to reach the moon, a robotic spacecraft, Luna 2, when it crashed on the lunar surface in September of 1959. These were followed by other lunar sites, including the first rover on the moon, Lunkakad, on Luna 17, which launched in 1970 and moved around for 11 lunar days. The U.S. has had its own early robotics, the Ranger, lunar orbiters, and surveyor missions that impacted the moon. Well, Lisa and I, I think, wanted to be the first space archaeologists on the moon, but we were beaten out by the Apollo 12 astronauts, Alan Bean and Pete Conrad in 1969, who did the first archaeological survey on Surveyor 3, a robotic spacecraft which had landed on the moon in 1967. And we gratefully award them the distinction of being the first space archaeologists. Our colleague, Pete Capilotti, has said, quote, they performed the first example of formational archaeology and the study of the environmental and cultural forces upon the life history of human artifacts in space. Both the earliest and the latest material on the moon tends to be concentrated around the lunar equator. There is also material remains on the south pole of the moon and the far side of the moon. There are a lot of artifacts and important significant sites on the moon. And that means there are risks to preserving them. And Lisa will talk about those. Thanks, Beth. You know, our, our fascination with the past can also cause harm. You ask just about anyone where they would wanna go if they could go to the moon, and most people are gonna say Tranquility Base. I firmly believe that most people don't actually wanna cause harm but they just don't know that their actions can cause damage to sites. I mean, how many of you have an Uncle Ed that likes to talk about his arrowhead hunting days as a kid? Or have you noticed maybe that you, know, you go to a, visit a museum or a historic site and there are stanchions and fences separating you from the site? That's because human visitation damages sites. These cultural resources are non-renewable. Once the damage occurs, it cannot be undone. And there are examples on the screen that show how vandalism has impacted some of our well-known heritage sites. It's reasonable to assume that visitors to archeological sites on the moon are going to behave in a similar manner as to how they behave here at sites on earth. At Tranquility Base though, we have added problems. We have a lack of supervision, there are no moon cops. And because we don't have a lot of experience moving around on the moon, we have an inability to control one's movement due to a reduction in gravity, plume ejecta, blast zones. And then back here on Earth, the black or the commercial market for artifacts is one of the biggest threats to our space heritage. Charlie Duke of Apollo 16 legally sold this red pin flag online. And when he sold it in 2010, it went for $16,000 for that red pin flag. There is money to be made, yet I think we need to ask ourselves if monetizing our heritage is appropriate or not. Now, fortunately, Beth had the opportunity to work directly with NASA on establishing some guidelines for how one can interact with important sites on the moon. Beth? Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, for me, one of the most exciting moments in my career in, and in historic preservation on the moon was a call I got from NASA in 2010 to help write its guidelines in a workshop at Kennedy Space Center. And remember, in 2010, the Google X Prize was still in play and NASA wanted to give guidance. NASA wanted to know how to preserve their, quote, equipment on the lunar surface. 
A big victory for me and Lisa was when they replied that with the word artifact. Okay. Um, note that these are guidelines or recommendations. They do not specifically cite federal preservation law, but they do put NASA on record that it is committed to preserving the scientific and historic values of all US lunar sites. Working as the only archeologist on the guidelines with many lunar scientists and historians, we established radii or buffers around the sites on the moon that restrict overflights, landing and visitation by future spacecraft. Next. Well, I had the privilege of working with some of the NASA people who had actually helped to place Apollo astronauts on the moon. And all of us agreed that Apollo 11, the first lunar landing site, and Apollo 17, the last lunar landing site, were two of the most significant sites. And so a larger radii was established that restricts any close inspection by visiting future robotics or astronauts. In 2010, we space archaeologists, when the guidelines were issued, knew that NASA had made a giant leap for historic preservation. But the big step for space archaeology and heritage is not enough. In the end, it is only the US, it is not only the US who should be involved. There needs to be agreements by spacefaring nations to preserve their own and each other's space heritage. Only by international efforts will the totality of this extraordinary archaeological assemblage and sites on the moon be preserved. And I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to talk about the international effort. Thank you, Beth. You know, international treaties that govern the moon have been playing a, a huge role in the conversation about preservation of space heritage on the moon. And I'm not an attorney, but this is what I understand. There are two primary treaties that are relevant here, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty and the 1984 United Nations Moon Agreement. And what these things say, among other things, is that nations who signed these treaties retain jurisdiction and control over their own property or their materials while it is in outer space or on a celestial body or on the moon. NASA still owns, retains ownership of the artifacts that are up there. And actually this is documented separately by NASA. There are other nations that have materials on the moon and those nations, also retain ownership of their materials and other nations' materials and equipment, the sites, could actually be used by another nation if human survival is at stake. Kind of makes sense, actually. These agreements also say, essentially, that nobody can claim ownership over the surface or the subsurface of the moon. And so for that reason, the registry listings that Beth and I talked about for California and New Mexico are composed only of the objects. They do not include the famous, foot, a famous uh, first footprint or any of the astronaut tracks. This is a deviation from typical archaeology. When we look at archaeological sites, we look at this three-dimensional entity that is composed normally of surface and subsurface constituents. In this case, because of the way that these laws are written, we could not include the lunar surface or subsurface materials as part of the designation. It's just the materials themselves. Listing just actually formally memorializes the historical significance of the resource and the event. And attorneys from California and New Mexico were, were involved in this and they confirmed that designating those sites on the state registers does not extend jurisdiction over the moon or the site in any way. Now, I would argue that perception of extending jurisdiction could be just as damaging, so to speak, but we can speak to that um, a little bit later. But these sites that, that are on these lists just simply say, hey, these sites are on these lists because they are important to our heritage. That, that's really what it is. It's, it's symbolic more than anything. Because unfortunately, we have no single international historic preservation law that specifically addresses space heritage on the moon. People were not concerned about historic preservation when they, when they signed these treaties, when they drafted them in the first place, when they wrote federal preservation law in the first place. And this is really ironic because 
we have to consider how important the moon has been to people for millions of years. Beth? Well, thank you, Lisa. I think we'd both like to stress that right now we have the opportunity, it's however difficult or slim, to stay, take steps to preserve space heritage, to come together as an international community to preserve a significant part of space history or it will be gone. In conclusion, I think it's important to include all humanity in our efforts. All cultures on earth have a relationship to the moon. All peoples look at the heavens, the skies, and the moon. It clocks our days. All peoples look at space. The structures at Stonehenge built about 5,000 years ago charted the mid-winter moonset and the midsummer moonrise. There are stories from all indigenous cultures like the First Nations of the Yukon, Canada, where I have worked, that have a narrative about Crow who stole the moon from his grandfather and threw it up into the sky for all of us. The stars and celestial bodies have been named, used to navigate, track the season, and provide moral guidance to cultures. Each human population on Earth has a relationship and rights to the moon through its culture. The moon really belongs to all of us. If there is anything we have learned in the last few years is that we are one species. What happens to one happens to us all. We must include non-spacefaring nations in preserving a place so rare and so remote that it is the legacy of all human beings. It is a place of wonderful artifacts and events and it is a place of cultural heritage. It is where humanity's memories are stored. Lisa? You know, I think it's important to note in conclusion that our generation has a really rare opportunity to both witness and preserve a really important milestone in human history. And unlike other historical sites on earth, many of which do not rise to the same level of significance, frankly, Tranquility Base has not yet suffered from erosion, vandalism, or destruction. I feel like we are ethically obligated to our descendants to do something now while we still can to preserve the site. I don't think we want future generations looking back at us with a critical eye. I think that we want them to look back at us and smile and acknowledge that this was one giant leap for historic preservation. In closing, um, you know, Apollo 16 astronaut Charlie Duke left a unique artifact on the lunar surface on April 20th, 1972. Just over 50 years ago today, he put a picture of his wife and his two children on the moon. And it is part of our amazing space archeological heritage. Thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Bill? Thank you, that was wonderful. Moving on to the panel. Uh, Michelle Hanlon is going to be our panel leader, and Michelle Wilmot is also joining us. Michelle Hanlon, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and oh my goodness, Lisa and uh, Beth, that was amazing. I mean, I um, we have worked together closely, um, and I, I've always known of your work and the incredible amount of uh, passion and uh, just sheer stuff you have done but I've never seen your presentation. And so, you know, my hat is off to you. Thank you so much for all that you have done. It has been incredible. And you have truly made that first baby step, which is which we will look back on as the giant leap. Um, before I turn it over to Michelle to talk a little bit more about what she's doing more specifically with the lunar rovers, bringing us sort of back into the celebration of Apollo 16, I just want to say, and I'll talk a lot more about the international aspects of it, because that's where my NGO for All Mankind comes in. By the way, everybody, I'm Michelle Hanlon. I'm the president of the National Space Society. I'm a space lawyer. I teach space law at the University of Mississippi, and I'm also the co-founder and president of For All Mankind, which is the only organization in the world which is taking the work of Beth and Lisa and introducing it to the international community and trying to negotiate that international convention that Lisa and Beth envisioned so many years ago. Um, 
the one thing I did want to say is as we as we are trying to internationalize this, a couple of things that we always point out to people is that Neil and Buzz also brought the medallions of Yuri Gagarin and uh, Kosmonaut Komarov. You know, so it wasn't just the Americans they were celebrating when they landed on the moon. I also like to point out that 650 million people watched that moon landing live. It was a cultural event that brought us all together. And when you think about why, um, at, at For All Mankind, we've created what we're calling a um, heritage uh, segmentation chart. And so we are working back from that blueprint and going through all the cultures, all the things that we needed to get us to the moon. So that, that moon landing uh, involved 60,000 people directly, but in, it involved all of humanity because we don't get to the moon unless that person in Lytoli stands up on two feet. We don't get to the moon unless somebody in Mesopotamia makes glass. So it really is a very universal event. It is, and I, I agree completely with Lisa and Beth that uh, it, it is an unparalleled achievement and it should be heralded in as, I mean, it that that blueprint and tranquility base is is like totally for our spacefaring species. Um, so I, I've seen a lot of really great questions, um, but I, I wanted, uh, want Michelle to uh, come in and bring this back to Apollo 16, which we are celebrating today, um, specifically talking about the, the three rovers that are up there and um, all the work that you've done, again, uh, balancing international and national law to try and, and take steps to make, take the first steps to protect these artifacts. Thank you, Michelle. And I have just have to say, I am so honored to join all of you today. Um, Michelle, I first saw you, even though we didn't get to meet when you made a presentation at Seattle's Museum of Flight, um, just the year that we were celebrating Apollo 11 and the 50th anniversary. And then um, Beth has been so encouraging to me as we um, at the city of Kent uh, pursued landmark status for the lunar rovers. Um, just for introductions, my name is Michelle Wilmot. I work for the city of Kent, Washington. Uh, Kent is the sixth largest city in the state, and we are also home to Boeing's original space center. Um, this is where the Apollo lunar rovers were um, ultimately built and tested. Um, for use by NASA during the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 missions. And I just wanted to show um, just a quick photo of one of the photos that has been a big inspiration um, for us here in the city of Kent. This is a photo of Kent's first uh, female mayor, Mayor Isabel Hogan, and she along with some of her children and some Boeing executives are at the Boeing Space Center and they are inspecting and checking out the very first uh, lunar rovers that were built in, here in Kent. And this is a real big inspiration for staff who are at the city still today. One who is with is uh, Mayor Hogan's daughter-in-law. She works in our parks department for us to actually commemorate this amazing history uh, by placing a lunar rover replica in a downtown Kent Park. But I wanted just to show that to you because this, this is where the inspiration really first came from. I can't take um, great credit for it. Although this work that I've been doing to really draw attention to this incredible history that um, is that Kent, in fact, was part of, um, played a role in the Apollo program is something that um, we're immensely proud of and a lot of people didn't really know until we pursued um, the landmark status with the help of these amazing ladies on the panel today. Um, we were told very regularly that this was an impossible, um, an impossible task <laughs> and, and we learned that it had, in fact, uh, been done in Mexico and California and or New Mexico and California rather and um, so we pursued it. Um, we started a year long campaign uh, to, and we and we really tried to leverage the attention that Apollo 5, um, 11 was receiving. We knew that um, the later missions of Apollo wouldn't receive the same 
level of, of interest and attention, certainly by the media. Um, so we really tried to draw attention to that while, while um, so many were paying attention to the 50th anniversary. And there was events and activities happening all over our state, in particular in Seattle with having the Museum of Flight there. We had an amazing event where Buzz Aldrin was actually a guest and spoke to a whole bunch of folks about what it was like to be um, part of, a, of Apollo 11. Um, we started our campaign um, just by drawing awareness to the fact that um, the lunar rovers were actually built in Kent. Boeing at one time was um, Kent's, and in fact, was Washington's largest employer, and certainly Kent's largest employer at the time. Um, they've significantly reduced their size since then, but being in an industrial area um, with lots of buildings around, there's a lot of um, uh, indescript uh, buildings. You have no idea what's going on in those buildings. And um, even today, the most amazing innovations are being made in Kent and a lot of people don't know them. So part of my role in economic development is to shine a light on these amazing um, um, innovations that have been built, starting with the, um, the lunar rovers for sure. A whole lot of great things have been done um, by the Boeing company in Kent. Apparently, um, we had a role in creating um, the, the um, parts of the Hubble telescope were built in Kent, um, part of the the rockets that took the um, astronauts to the moon on Apollo 11 were built by Boeing and Kent. And then we love to say this, um, Hexel, Washington. Hexel is, is a composites manufacturer that is international in scope, but they do have facilities in Kent. They actually um, created the composite materials on the foot landing pads of the lunar landing module. So those were actually the very first footprints on the moon. They beat Neil Armstrong. <laughs> we love to tell that story. Um, but um, those, Hexel is still in Kent today. So the fact that we have um, amazing companies doing that have been doing amazing things um, historically, and now Kent is home to Blue Origin. So we love to see the fact that not only do we have a, a historical um, relevance to space um, travel, but certainly um, what's happening now with, with the commercialization of, of space travel, looking in the private sector beyond um, the work that NASA has done um, is something that we're immensely proud of. And we really want to inspire our, our young people to pursue these amazing opportunities, which is I know um, Beth mentioned earlier, it's like, how do we inspire kids to, to pursue opportunities um, in, the, in our current and future generations? Um, and how do we recognize the history we have? Um, it's incredibly important to us too um, with this work. So what we really did, I don't have a science background. I'm a, a public relations and communications professional. <laughs> That's where my training comes from. Um, I have, as over the course of this work, it's been one of my most thrilling projects to work on. Um, with the help of the Boeing company, as we were making this, this um, pursuit to um, achieve count first, Boeing actually um, introduced me to several of the engineers who worked on the um, original lunar rovers. Uh, there's several of them that are still here in our community. and. Um, they were so excited that we were paying attention to them and the work that they had done as they were all retired now. Um, but we took them with us along for this ride. They helped um, testify at public hearings. We went, they, they went with us to um, speaking engagements, both at um, the Museum of Flight and the History Museum in Tacoma. These guys were just thrilled to be able to speak about the incredible work they did in a very short amount of time. We were able to achieve historic landmark status um, by King County in July of 2019. And what we really did was just really drive home um, the, the role that um, so many employees in Washington State had in, in the role in, in um, 
the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 programs because of the lunar rovers themselves. Um, and, and it was a media campaign, basically. Um, we, we had planned to um, have a, a very large hearing um, by the Washington State Landmarks Commission, which was delayed once COVID um, hit. But right before COVID um, hit uh, in March, we had um, um, built our lunar rover replica that is ultimately going to be placed in a downtown park. The construction of that park is going to begin this summer. We hope to um, do our grand opening celebration in um, to coincide with a mission of Apollo uh, 17. Obviously, the last time we have gone to the moon that um, will be happening here this fall. Uh, but I wanted just to show you why we're doing this. I have um, a video of the festival where we unveiled the lunar rover replica to a group of very excited people. Tonight we are at Shower Center in Kent and we are here for the unveiling of our lunar rover replica. Super exciting culmination of a ton of work but also the kickoff of a much longer, bigger community process. Mayor, so do you remember where you were when a man first walked on the moon? I think that I was not alive when a man first walked on the moon, so I don't remember where I was. That's a great answer actually. <laughs> Uh, Michelle? What I'm hearing and what, I, what I'm loving about this conversation is, um, you know, this is something uh, normal people like us can do. I mean, uh, you know, the, this is, and we need everybody, every discipline. We need scientists to help us figure out how to protect. We need archaeologists to figure out what to protect. We need um, media communication specialists to um, help explain to the public why we need to protect. And of course, we need lawyers because you know, lawyers like to immerse themselves anywhere they can. So uh, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to uh, sort of talk about the law because there are a lot of questions that came up about why aren't these UNESCO World Heritage Sites and you know, there, aren't they national parks? And this is really one of the, um, one of the reasons uh, my work is so hard at For All Mankind is because people just assume everything is protected. People just assume, well, of course, it's, it's you know, it's Apollo Tranquility Base, of course it's protected. Um, Eddie Bernice Johnson actually tried to make it a national park um, and, and bring it within the purview of the Department of Interior. Unfortunately, international law makes that outright illegal. We cannot claim that any anything, the United States, no country can. So. The, um, the Outer Space Treaty, as Lisa mentioned, um, was negotiated during the Cold War at a time when all we were concerned about was keeping the peace, right? We didn't want uh, the Russians to be bombing us from space and vice versa. And so nobody thought about other things. Nobody thought about it. the biggest gaps we're seeing right now are uh, commercial space and heritage. And why would anybody in the 19... 50s and 60s think about commercial space. Only states could afford to go to space, only nations. Why would anybody think about heritage? I, um, I speak all the time with the, uh, the delegation of Greece to the uh, United Nations, and they're like, heritage is something that's 5,000 years old, not 50 years old. So it's really, it's, it's even a mindset of how can we have heritage on the moon? We've only been there 50 years. But the Outer Space Treaty, the main component, the very most fundamental aspect of the Outer Space Treaty is freedom and ex of exploration and use and access to all areas of celestial bodies. So think about that. That is inherently, it, it inherently conflicts with the concept of trying to protect anything in space. We, at, it, the Outer Space Treaty essentially says you cannot protect. You, everybody has the right to access. 
um, that freedom is has only very few restrictions against it. One, it, there are some rules in space about um, where you can put weapons, um, but the only thing that we have to protect our artifacts and our sites are this concept of due regard. Um, and that this is, you have to have due regard for the activities of others um, when you are implementing your space activities. I should also say the very second article of the Outer Space Treaty is no national appropriation. You cannot claim territory in space by sovereignty or by any other means. And so those three, those little words, or by any other means, are where all of this kerfuffle comes up. Because saying we would like Tranquility Base to be a national park, we would like it to be a New Mexico heritage site, that is claiming territory by a means. That is illegal. So what do we do? Um, and we, I've seen in the comments, we need an international agreement. Beth said, we need an international agreement. Uh, my husband and I formed For All Mankind in 2017 to create that national agreement. I'm an M&A attorney by, trading, by trade, and I thought I am gonna get this thing done because that's what I do, I close deals. I can get this done by the anniversary of Apollo 11, no problem. So here we are, obviously it didn't work. The United Nations works very, very slowly. For All Mankind is a uh, permanent observer to the United Nations. We go to Vienna six times a year to talk about protecting heritage. We engage with delegates. I can tell you right now that the, um, the uh, Russian delegates are actually very leery of us. Why? Because they've actually already sold their heritage. They sold Lunacod 2 to a private citizen, Richard Garriott. They sold a lot of the um, material that they brought back uh, when they were going through a cash flow issue. They, they just sold everything willy nilly. And so their concept of heritage makes them feel ashamed, right? Because they sold this stuff. Uh, the Chinese delegates are really, really interested, although we don't really uh, trust their um, uh, integrity in terms of why they're looking at us because these safety zones that um, Beth was able to help implement were really great, they're voluntary, but um, unfortunately, uh, NASA didn't talk to State Department when they were talking about the concept of safety zones. And so this concept of safety zones was like introduced to the international community as kind of, and kind of surprising. And it made people not worried about heritage think, oh, well, if it's so, uh, if that plume effect is so damaging, when I have an operational thing up there, then I should have a very large radius or worse, um, I can create immediate heritage. When Luna 2 impacted the moon uh, 10 years before Apollo 11, it, sh it shattered and created a radius of fragments. Um, so are each of those fragments artifacts that need to be protected? What kind of a zone do we need around that? So what's the danger there? Well, if you create a protective zone and somebody decides I'm just gonna you know, bomb an area 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers, these are my artifacts, don't touch them. They've claimed an awfully large part of the moon. So, but the safety zones have, have now been um, you know, really talked about a lot since they were brought up in the 2011 NASA guidelines. Um, and as Beth pointed out, the guidelines are voluntary. They are not binding on anybody at all. Until we created the One Small Step Act, um, uh, For All Mankind worked with uh, Senator Gary Peters' office, Senator Ted Cruz's office, and we passed the One Small Step Act. We wanted the One Small Step Act to say that the guidelines will be binding on any American uh, entity that goes to the moon. It got watered down an awful lot. So now it just says, if you are an entity working with NASA and going to the moon. So you see the difficulty. We have a lot of people and I've seen in the chat say, oh, well, you know, we should protect the whole moon. Um, and then there's other people saying, no, there's resources there that we need. I talked to uh, Harrison Schmidt and he's like, why would you save Apollo 17? We need to recycle it. Um, so there's all sorts of different, different concepts and we need to get everybody balanced. The other sort of an, um, achievement that For All Mankind has, has uh, uh, accomplished is that there's something now called the Artemis Accords. 
that the United States negotiated with eight other nations, and now 18 other nations have signed them. The Artemis Accords are intended to sort of fill in a lot of the gaps in the Outer Space Treaty. And one of the gaps, Gabriel Swinney from the Department of State, Mike Gold from NASA, listened to us. And one of the gaps is filled by Section 9 of the Artemis Accords, which actually is the very first multilateral instrument ever, 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 to recognize that we have, that we humans have heritage on the moon. So that is just, and now 18 nations, we have 18 nations that have agreed we have human heritage on the moon that needs to be protected. Um, you can, I mean, it's going to take a long time to figure out how and what and so forth, but, but it's out there now. And we are working very hard. There's a new a committee at the Committee of the, uh, on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space at the United Nations. There's now a working group to look at a legal framework, legal issues regarding um, mining the moon. Uh, and mining space resources in general. And we are talking to them already about starting that discussion with the discussion of heritage because heritage is our most important resource in space. And so we're working really hard to get them to internalize that at the international level. One more thing before we go to more of the panel questions, the, um, the, the World Heritage Convention is amazing. 193 nations have ratified it. 193 nations recognize how important heritage is, how important it is to build kinship among all humanity. The problem is, in order to um, nominate a site for the World Heritage, it has to be in your territory. So we can't even do that. We can't even say to the national community, hey, can we make this? Because it looks like we're claiming territory. So we actually talked to the uh, UNESCO at length when we first started this effort, um, and they want nothing to do with space. They have enough issues here on Earth when people uh, nominate sites which are in areas of conflict, right? Oh, no, it's ours. No, it's ours. So they want nothing to do with um, heritage in space where there is no jurisdiction. And I have actually, we've, uh, they actually told me in January hey, we really love what you're doing and we're really having problems figuring out how to do it in the high seas. So you go girl and you get it done and then we're gonna borrow that and apply it here on earth. So it was really, really interesting because, because you know why? Because they're overworked. Um, we, we are a group of uh, volunteer attorneys. Uh, there's about a hundred of us now. We meet um, every two months and we talk about the next steps and what, what we're going to do next and what we're going to say to the UN next and how we can get the UN to agree to this. And I will say every time we address the United Nations, not one delegation, even the Russians, even the Chinese, not one has ever said that is a stupid idea. Everybody says, absolutely, have to do it. Developing nations that have nothing to do with space yet have to do it but it's really, really hard. And there's a lot of other things going on in the world. And so it's really up to people like us, people like everybody here on this call who's participating, because clearly you understand, you take pride in that human achievement of Apollo 16, which we're celebrating today, and in that human achievement of all, of we, all that we've managed to do in space, especially as Lisa said, when we had no business being on the moon. I mean, the fact that we haven't been back in 50 years just screams about how incredible that was. And the, I'm just gonna say one more thing. The, um, we For All Mankind is getting challenged by China because um, on those messages of peace, those messages of peace from 74 nations are on a disc um, on the, on the uh, Tranquility base. Um, one of the messages is from Jiang Kai-shek who was then the president of Taiwan. And so China is objecting to our status as a um, uh, UN observer because we are not recognizing that Taiwan is a province of China. And so I, did, I have been in negotiating with them at the United Nations NGO committee. And I said, we are about history. And the one thing we are truly about is that you cannot erase history. The fact of the matter is there is a disc on the moon that has a letter from Chiang Kai-shek, president of China. You cannot erase that. Think about it. If they want to erase that, how easy would it be for them in the next 100, 200, 300 years to say, oh, no, we were the first on the moon. And I'm not, I'm not saying it because, you know, they're bad people. I'm just saying pe the, victors, the victors create history. We 
need we owe it to ourselves and our future to make sure that that site is protected. So I know we're running out of time, and I, I love discussion, but I did want to bring up just the um, you talked about people selling uh, vandalism yeah. and um, talk about the bag that Sotheby's sold that first bag, the first man. And and not only that, I mean, I, the legal aspects of it are really fascinating. Um, but then they just sold those microscopic pieces for, you know, a ridiculous amount of money. Yes. How, can you just sort of give us sort of the archaeological yeah. response to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can only speak to it from the archaeological perspective. So thank you for acknowledging that because I'm not an attorney. But um, that that kind of sale of antiquities is really hard for archaeologists to stomach. Um, that is monetizing our heritage, and we are, as professional archaeologists, bound to standards of ethics and performance that prohibit selling heritage, digging illegally, doing anything that jeopardizes you know, the, those, those materials, you know, in the case of artifacts, and I would, ex, I would expect, uh, you know, lunar samples as well, although I'm not a geologist directly, but, you know, people who acquire pieces, artifacts and pieces of art don't always realize that even just handling them, just storing them in their house in a completely different environment can have a major effect on the integrity, the physical integrity of it. One example, is when you excavate an artifact that has been below the surface for a very, very long time, and you bring it out and you bring it up into the atmosphere, you have changed the temperature, you've changed the, you know, the, the contact that it has with weather, everything about it, the environment has completely changed. And so that's why when you, when you go to a museum, Artifacts are stored in climate controlled facilities with acid free and museum quality materials, because even even when you handle it oils on your fingers can degrade artifacts and so the preservation of those materials is more than just making sure that it's done legally and ethically it's also about the condition. And so when I see things like this that are being sold. On the, and in granted, it may be like in the case of the pin flag that Charlie Duke sold legal. Um, but when that pin flag gets handled and put on a mantelpiece or subjected to direct sunlight and it starts to fade over time, it starts to deteriorate. And so th that's one of the nice things about museums. And, and you look at the Smithsonian has hundreds of, of conservationists and curators that are specifically trained in how to preserve the material culture. It, it goes beyond just, you know, walking around and trampling on a site. The preservation aspect is much more broad than that. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of my reaction to those kinds of things. No, absolutely. Beth, did you have something to add to that? Yeah. Archaeologists destroy sites, okay? <laughs> they do it scientifically. So what they do is as they're going through, as Lisa said, and, and excavating and finding sherds and other things, they are recording precise and accurate information about where those artifacts are found and correlating that with the all, all the other artifacts found on an assemblage. And to make a comment about the, the pin flag, there is a huge um, black market in artifacts, doesn't have to be from the moon, even though space stuff is very uh, demand in demand, but that essentially allows heritage to be gone. Now, when um, Charles Duke sold that, he did it legally because it was part of his own kit, okay? Now, Neil Armstrong, when he passed away, his widow found 17 objects in his closet. <laughs> that included stuff on his mission. Would I begrudge Neil Armstrong his own collection? In no way. And what happened was the widow donated it to the Smithsonian. So we have to think about the archeological um, protocols, the archeological method and theory that allows us to do our work because archeology span is a very unique discipline. It relates material culture, any artifact, any feature, okay, to patterns of human behavior. And no other discipline does that. 
without guidance from archaeologists, without looking at how to best preserve this. Archaeologists re return to sites all the time on Earth, okay? But if stuff is damaged or gone, then we don't have that information. It's uh, that the way you said it is so poignant, um, and I and I think you know that it's also one of the biggest fears of for our own kind is um, we lost NASA lost the first bag it legally lost possession of it so that it was able to be sold by a private individual. NASA lost that at a time when we only had one one or two missions a year to the moon. Imagine as commercial space picks up, and we know the value of this these materials and these artifacts. I mean, people could sell them and fund entire space missions and and people would do that and there are collectors who would purchase that. So this is again you're right the um, that the it's not just about getting up to the site and protecting it putting up a fence. Um, but the. Um, you know if something does manage to get back to earth, we need to get it involved in the, the um, all of the criminal acts uh, enforcement that we have. Um, here on Earth. Um, Michelle, I have a little bit more of a whimsical question, I think. I, um, I was recently at a, at a presentation where um, an, uh, an archaeologist was talking about graffiti in Pompeii. And re really fascinating to think that, you know, this graffiti had been preserved and that we've been, humans have just had this urge to write on walls all their life, you know, since time eternal, right? I've heard rumors that some of the engineers wrote their names in Sharpie on the rovers. Um, is there any truth to that? If, if there is, you know, it's probably a violation of NASA protocols, right? <laughs> uh, you would know better than I as far as the NASA protocols on that, but I have also heard those same rumors and I have asked um, the gentleman that I worked with who worked on the rovers themselves, if they could point me in the direction of who those people might have been or if they could confirm. And I have not been able to get to the bottom of those um, rumors myself. It's, I, I think it's a great question. I'd love to find out. I, um, unfortunately, I can't confirm. <laughs> we'll have to send Lisa and Beth up to find that. And, <laughs> and, and the artwork, right? Apollo, Apollo 12, with their the ceramic art actually made it to a lot of mysteries, right? Did Neil drop his daughter's locket, um, you know, that so so many mysteries. I'm going to suggest that we weave the questions that are coming from people into your panel. Uh, but also, we have a chapter here that has been in attendance, and they've been very nicely on mute all this time. So when we want to ask questions, I want to kind of give them preference. We're at 8.30, so I am going to go to Judy and see if anybody um, watching with Judy has any questions. Yes, yes we do have some questions. Colleen Forrest um, with the uh, St. Louis Space Frontiers. And uh, I was just wondering if you're looking for other states to sign on uh, to do those uh, national historical or, or state historical site things. And yes. if Missouri was one of those that was available to do so, because we have a lot of heritage in there. Yes, we, we've actually, Beth and I have spent a lot of time talking with the um, state historic preservation <laughs> officers for all of the states in the entire country. We actually went to Washington DC and attended the Nick Shippo meeting and, and kind of gave a presentation and we were, we were really overwhelmed by the support that we received. Puerto Rico was really interested. We had interest from New York. A lot of different um, states were interested in it, but we found the same thing though that I mentioned earlier about some states don't have a legal mechanism that allows that. And the two that are, that probably come to mind in most people's minds about opportunities for this would be Florida and also Texas. And both of those states, we met with the state historic preservation officers at the time, and they both said the same thing. They said, we would love to do this, but we can't because our particular state laws require that resources like Cape Canaveral, like Mission Control, in order to be on their state registers, would have had to, uh, or excuse me, um, in order for Tranquility Base to be on their state registers, it would have had to be in the physical territory boundaries of the states, and we couldn't do that. So we, you know, we're kind of in, in Hawaii, I mentioned the same thing, you know, so we're, we're really, we're hoping that maybe some of those laws might change in the future and more align with 
um, California, New Mexico, but uh, unfortunately, that's it, that's a bigger challenge than we, we were able to. Uh, to yeah, I was asking, yeah, do you know specifically specifically about Missouri though that you can recall offhand or? No, Missouri did not express any interest to us at the time, but we are all, you know, we are open to that. If anybody <laughs> from Missouri is listening and is in the State Historic Preservation Officer, uh, yeah. their office, we would love to have that conversation because there's so many ties to so many different states. Ohio is another one that's really, Michigan has ties. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ties that a lot of people don't realize. When we went to the SHPO conference and um, the person who just spoke should speak with their state historic preservation officer, usually they have a council or a committee that makes decisions on properties that go on the state register and some don't have state registers. But in the example of Florida and Texas, they have many properties that are on the National Register of Historic Places and our National Historic Landmarks. And if I could follow up on a comment uh, to Michelle, um, in the last two months, ICOMIS has put together an aerospace heritage task force, um, you know, working in parallel with um, now commissioners from all over the world, including Russia, um, who are interested in preserving heritage uh, in space both on earth and in space. So I'm very excited to, to be on that commission. And the head is uh, the past director of Polar Heritage. And of course, if you've been reading in the news, the Endurance, Shackleton's uh, ship was found in 7,000 feet of water off the coast of Antarctica. And um, they have it's in really good condition and they have come up with a policy statement about that. So under underwater archeology, span archaeology in Antarctica is analogous to space. It's not exactly the same, but the fact is there are so many more people working on this um, and, and hopefully jointly we succeed in the next 10 years <laughs> to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. All right, you're on, Michelle. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to Bennett's question. Um, that was directed to Lisa talking about human activity and human use and what whether you consider non-human archaeology. You know, um, I think think about uh, U two two uh, or Lunacod two or or you know is Michelle. Um, well, I guess the the lunar rovers were were not autonomous. So, do you view them differently as archaeologists or? Well, so as archaeologists, what we're looking at are the material remains of the past. The, the things left behind by humans and human activity. We're not looking at non-human activity. Um, one of our jobs, one of our jobs as archaeologists is to be able to look at something and determine if it is natural or cultural. Is it caused by human? And, it, and is it basically made, modified, or moved by a human? And that can take many different forms. And when you look at archaeology all over the world, terrestrial archaeology, it comes in a really wide ranging, you know, range of forms. It can be anything from typical, what you might think as ruins or artifacts on the surface to raw material that has been transported and not modified, but moved from one lithic source, a rock source, for example, that is a volcanic source that is really good material for creating stone tools. And it was carried by somebody a long distance on foot and then used at a location elsewhere, it was moved. And maybe it wasn't actually modified, but it's still you know, a cultural resource because it was made modified or moved by a human. And so that's what we're really looking at. And so to us, you know, when we look, when we say cultural resource, it doesn't actually have to be human remains or you know, materials that are clearly you know, descending from a human. They just, um, it just has to be an object at minimum. I don't know if that answers the question. I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but I hope that helps. There are crash sites on the moon. There's a lot more crash sites than there are sites where human beings walked. Yes. Well, humans created those spacecraft that were intentionally or unintentionally crashed on the moon. And uh, Dirk Spenneman, one of our colleagues in Australia, uh, looked at the space shuttle that was crashed. And that pieces fallen um, all over Texas and Oklahoma. So crash sites, those artifacts, those material remains are important in the history of space exploration and heritage. 
So the little rover had to be put there by uh, first by the Russians and then later by the United States. So even though um, the, the Russian rovers were not manned, there were nobody on there, they were not driven by people, they're still important because essentially the, the USSR had the first rover um, and then Michelle uh, Wilmont uh, recognized that the rovers that were driven by the Apollo astronauts were really important and they remain on the moon, of course. Thank you, Beth. So the Michelle, think, thinking of those rovers um, and um, when you, I think there was a Bible left on one and I think John Young left a picture of his family on one. Did you, when you, when you created them as uh, uh, artifacts in Washington state, do you also consider the stuff that was left on them? I think, I think Harrison Schmidt said he left a lens cap and he was anxious to see what it looked like. And uh, do you, do you identify those, recognize them, call them out? We did not in our, um, in our pursuit. We were told um, that even trying to get the rovers, which were um, more significant um, in size was going to be challenging until we brought um, Beth and Lisa's work to their attention. <laughs> um, so we, we really focused on the design of those rovers um, here in our region and um, we didn't call out the other objects, although I understand um, all of the um, additional materials that the astronauts had with them has all been documented. Um, um, but we, we did not include that in our landmark application. So it, it, it is interesting because when we, we um, under international law, we have this registration convention. Um, everything that gets launched into space has to be registered with the United Nations. Um, that doesn't extend to payload or objects going to the moon. And so in the, re in the UN registry, um, the Eagle's not even on the, reg on the international registry. Um, it just has the Saturn V because that's the only thing that launched. And so I put in the chat um, early on, uh, we're trying to we're trying to create a digital registry showing all of the stuff that's on the moon um, by sight. So um, and it's and it's been really fun because there's a lot that we don't know, you know, um, again, what what really is on that rover. And uh, we're also um, uh, documenting the hard landings that Beth talks about, including the hard landing that happened just last month on the far side of the moon with China. And so this is one of my biggest fears is um, these sort of uh, landings that nobody expected. Um, and the um, NASA is now planning on um, orbiting the moon with four or five different CubeSats. And um, I just, you know, my first question was, what is your end of life plan? for those CubeSats because they're gonna fall into the moon and, and they they really didn't have a good answer. So I guess for, for each of you to, to wrap us up um, before we go to a special event from Fred, um, I'll, and I'll start with with you, Beth, what is your, what is the biggest fear? Like what, what do you think um, is the most imminent uh, threat to heritage in space or on the moon right now? That's a good question, Michelle, and I, I don't have a uh, an answer off the top of my head. One of the things that, as archaeologists, we realize is that um, we need to have in place restrictions and protocols and laws that restrict uh, the use of significant archeological sites that contain artifacts that are important to a culture. And in the case of space, it's, it's important to uh, humanity. Um, Lisa talked about inadvertent things. People just pick up stuff and say, well, it's not gonna matter, it's one shirt. Um, it all matters. And um, I think we have seen uh, on earth, so many significant sites be damaged. Maybe part of it's still there, that's important. Um, but we don't have on the lunar surface 
anything besides social sanctions. And if you look at where all the concentration of artifacts are, it's mostly around the lunar equator. Interestingly enough, most of the recent uh, you know, activity has been away from that. Now, I happen to think that's got to do with the social sanction, that people don't want to be the first to land close to something that's important that they could destroy or at least damage. So those social sanctions are in place. And, and I think that the best thing that Lisa and I and our colleagues have learned is that engineers, physicists, people that are involved with all the incredible technology and research and design that went into getting and still goes into getting people to the moon, um, want to see their work preserved. We can't preserve everything. It doesn't happen on the earth, but we can take the time to say, we have some criteria here. We have the National Historic um, Preservation Act. We have the Burr Charter in Australia. We have ICOMIS, we have the World Heritage Site, which has criteria that says, let's decide what's really important because that's, that's what's gonna save things. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Lisa? Yeah, I think that um, for me, what, what I'm concerned about the most is the pending commercial tourism industry that's going to bring tourists to the, to the moon. And we can't right now do anything to prevent damage except for raising awareness. And that's really what Beth and I have been spending two decades doing is raising awareness and raising the, the profile of historic preservation in the minds of people who don't normally think about it. We want people to understand that these are important and that touching them and taking them take pieces of them home with them is damaging. It is incredibly damaging. And so building that kind of site stewardship kind of belief in people is I think the only defense that we have, except for maybe someday having laws. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot of return to the moon in the next 10 years, 20 years. Definitely within my lifetime, people will be back there again. And I am concerned about the inadvertent, the, the, the people that have just a great intention and um, they will cause damage. Thank you, Lisa. Very sobering. Michelle? I, you know, just from a, a nostalgia and historical standpoint, I, you know, we're excited to see the advancements being made um, in Kent, you know, with Blue Origin and their plans. Um, Elon Musk has certainly talked about going to the moon very soon. Um, Art Artemis is planning to do the same thing and, and um, sending the first first woman to the moon, we're, we're really excited to have a role in this. Um, the efforts that we did in you know, trying to, to landmark the lunar rovers remaining on the moon, of course, we'd love to make certain that, that those are recognized, those spots are recognized and honored and preserved. I, you know, we would love, Michelle, to support all of your work um, and Lisa and Beth's work in, in preserving these sites to the best of our ability. Um, you know, I, I don't know how you even do it. Um, what if something happened to them accidentally? I don't, I, you know, that that's one thing, but, you know, I think about um, Blue and, and other companies going there next. How will they know that they're not going to, to damage a site? I don't, you know, people smarter than me know how to do those things, I think, but we certainly would love to support these efforts to preserve these amazing um, milestones in our history. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'll wrap this up because um, Fred's going to take us back through history. But I just want to say um, thank you. I want to also do, you know, shout out to Apollo 16. Um, uh, Charlie Duke is <clears throat> is one of the astronauts who was actually supported for all mankind uh, vociferously. Um, he's he's uh, been kind enough to um, uh, point us out in the press and approve of all of our work and our moon registry. Um, but I, I think I, I, I just want to end with uh, 
I have had the honor of meeting a lot of Apollo engineers. And one of the things that really strikes me about them is the awe that they have for the actual astronauts. Um, and um, when you meet when you meet an astronaut, or whether a shuttle astronaut or a, a moonwalker, I mean, 201, there's a humbleness that you just, I, I don't, I was with uh, Sion Yi last night and I was, and I was just like, maybe going into space just makes you come back like smarter and wiser and more eloquent because I haven't met an astronaut who hasn't been amazing. But the point was um, Ron Creel, the NASA engineer has such reverence and that again makes you realize just how hard it is what they did, just how life-threatening it was, just how courageous it was, how inspiring it was. We need to protect the memories of those moonwalkers because like I said, like Lisa said, they had no business being there and they really, really, really did take a huge leap for all of humankind. And I think all of humankind, um, wants to celebrate it. And so I think if, if we can continue this groundswell, um, I think I think that our, we will be able to announce mission accomplished, maybe not in 10 years, but hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you so much to my panelists. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. And this, this has surpassed my expectations and they were already high. Um, and I, I, I do want to just put out one thing that didn't get asked, and that is contacts. We, we wanna keep this going. It seems to me we've kind of struck a chord here and it's important, it's really important. And, 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 and the National Space Society as a whole has gotta be behind all of this in a big way. So we need to figure out where we're going to start collecting. I mean, I noticed for example, uh, one, of the, one of the very important people here today, Ron Jones, mentions this, I work at Boeing in St. Louis. I'm a member of the Boeing Historical Council, uh, History Council. We have the building that built the Mercury and Gemini capsules. And one of our projects is to get our building 101, 101 added to the National Registry of Historic Monuments. We haven't re-energized that effort since COVID, but there is a group here aware of the importance of doing this. This is my point. We really need to pull together within an SS around this subject, coalesce around it. This is a good beginning. This is like the catalyst, this meeting right here can be the catalyst. So Michelle, since you're a president, I think you're the appropriate person to get that going. So I'm hoping that this is, this is the beginning of something really, really important. Absolutely. Um, I do wanna make just one comment, one little point. And that is that we, we've talked a lot about the moon. We've talked a lot about the earth, but there are other very important sites in space, not just Mars, but also in orbit, including the Hubble, including the International Space Station. And if I had my way, the International Space Station would stay in orbit and become a museum. That's my dream. I'd love to see that happen. I'd love to see some effort made to retrieve the Hubble and bring it back to this planet and I believe the Starship should be capable of doing that. Now, call me crazy, but these are things we could gather the world around. These are things that could become something uniting, again, the human race. And we could do this if we just simply took the lead. If we simply said, guys, wake up, we can actually do this. Who's with me? That kind of thing. Anyway, I'm gonna shut up and uh, Fred, you're gonna get the last word. Fred's gonna uh, take us back in time, back when Fred was a high school student, literally. Back in time, 50 years, where at the time there was very few people had movie cameras. So movie has been made by Fred, but it's a movie of still pictures because that's what he, a high school student, had when he watched Apollo 16 launch, right? So put up with that, put up with the, He's got, a, he's got a recording of the radio announcer announcing the launch, put up with the noise because he's recording a radio that's sitting beside him. And it's an old radio from 50 years ago. So you're gonna watch a little bit of the past. Okay, Fred, you're on. Oh, thank, thank you, Joe. And that was a great panel also. So um, yeah, so in 1972, I was in high school, about 16 years old and got down to Kennedy Space Center to watch the launch. 
and I took some Instamatic photos and now the narration on this launch is from the space writer Martin Caden. And so this is, uh, as far as I know, the only uh, existing recording of, of uh, him doing the narration. And he calls the launch as if it was a horse race. So you've never heard a launch call like this if you've not seen this here before. And uh, so he, he called launches like from Mercury on. But yeah, this is still the only recording that I know that exists. So here we go. We've got a hole, but right now, we're getting a smack on the count, and we're coming up on about 50 seconds. That's right, less than 50 to go. Well, remember, if we get to that pattern, look at that position, we have nine seconds of sitting on the ground where she doesn't move, and we wait. And that lift off takes place, that's about the rocket tilt. After the rocket tilt itself. And right now, we're completely on automatic, and we're going to go down to about 30 seconds to go. We have a perfect count this morning, everything has been perfect, and we're going to hope that she's going just the way it is right now. Now, we're going to go down to about 30 seconds to go. There's no gushing from the bird, clearly the bell after all I can watch the first thing following here. We call it our mission to kill the bird's working for it. 
and he is going to be at least and soon after this, the Earth State Genesee from the State Police should take place right now, and a few seconds later, if not, the State Power should fire. Still got it in there, still got it in there. Uh, here we go. We got separation of the air state. That's no stopping. Very calmly, very calmly. Still got it in sight. There it was. There she goes. <laughs> That's it. And thank you, folks, for attending our uh, our breakfast. One more to go. One breakfast to go in December. The last breakfast. Bottom line is, uh, in, in December, we will be doing another breakfast for Apollo 17 that's celebrating the final time man walked on the moon 50 years ago. Hope you all can make it back then. Thank you, Joe. Joe, yes, can I say thank you? Yes. Thank you. And I, I found I found out where all the people were who were supposed to be here. They were all at home watching. Okay. And this will be YouTube on uh, an SS channel and the SACL5 channel. So there will be other a chance for others to watch it. Thank All right. You. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Have a great Saturday. Bye-bye. <laughs>